keyword series and rights because uh, who are prominent in the public sphere, artists, writers, and intellectuals, to choose a work that they think is key both to their practice and to contemporary debates around difference. Uh, the word today is reform. Um, I won't say too much, but I will say that Sarah is a writer, a commentator, cultural critic. Um, Robin is a novelist, blogger, and together they have um, edited Critical Muslim, a publication that has come out. Has come out. Uh, well, is launching. It's on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will let Robin tell us a bit more about Sia. Um, yeah, I didn't know I was going to be introducing Zia until a few minutes ago, so here we go. Um, Zia, who is known from the, um, the media, from the television and magazines and newspapers, I suppose he's, his immediate label is that he writes about Islam, but he does much more than that. I think that's pigeonholing him. He writes about futures studies, he writes about science, he writes about culture, he writes about politics, he writes about economics, he writes about all kinds of things. Um, I remember discovering him about 10 years ago. I, I had a collection of essays. It's not, I, I don't think it's, an, it's a collection, isn't it, called Islam and Other Futures. I remember sitting in Damascus, um, getting ready to go to Saudi Arabia and reading that, and um, really feeling that I'd discovered something that really spoke to me. It wasn't this old cobwebby um, Islamic writing. It was, it was very, very contemporary and on the edge of things, and it was very open to all kinds of influences, um, and some really great criticism in there. Um, maybe my favourite book of his is Des Desperately Seeking Paradise, Journeys of a Skeptical Muslim, which if you don't know, you should know. It's a, a great book. Um, it's written in a very amusing way. It's very personal, but it's also a very comprehensive look at all the different trends that are happening within Islam, all the different things which are going on from the Sufism, from the Iranian Revolution, from what's going on in Indonesia, from the Tablighi Jamaat missionaries in this country. Um, um, I, I, I strongly recommend that book. His latest book is Reading the Qur'an, which um, lots of young Muslims recently have been telling me how um, much they've enjoyed that book, how provocative it is. I think it's a very important book, reading the Qur'an or, or rereading the Qur'an, other, other ways of looking at it. Um, I'll stop there, except to say that, uh, again, Critical Muslim, that he's editing the Critical Muslim, which I think is going to be a very successful new venture. So, Ziyadin Sardar on reform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a nice small group, so we can have a nice discussion, so I'll try and not to take my 40 minutes. I'll try and shorten my presentation so we can have a proper discussion. Uh, 18 months ago, I decided to reform myself. Now, the concise Oxford Dictionary describes reform as make or become better uh, or uh, for removal of faults and error, abolish or cure, or. Uh, uh, or remove malpractices. Anybody who knows me will tell you that I've got so many faults and errors that need to be removed, uh, but the one that I chose to concentrate on was a, was a very specific problem to me. I used to smoke cigars, and I smoked Havana cigars only. Now, I ought to tell you how I came to smoke Havana cigars. Uh, way back in history, in, in mid-70s, I was uh, in Saudi Arabia working at the Hajj Research Center, uh, which itself was a reformist organization. And uh, uh, it, for the first time in Saudi Arabia, they had a newspaper called Arab News, which had just started publishing. And my job was from 7 to 2, and I had nothing to do in the afternoon. Uh, and I happened to know the manager of Arab News, and he then hired me as a features editor of Arab News. Uh, so when my time came, I went to the, to the features editor uh, to do my features editing job, and I discovered, of course, there were no features. And I went to the editor and I said, well, where are the features? He said, well, they come in the wire, and, and, and when they come on the wire, they have words missing in them, and your job is to put the words in, in, you know, in the old tally printer type, and you know, when they used to type in this tally printer, they used to, it'll miss out in a letter or a word. He says, your job is to put that in. So that's what I did for three, four days, and I said, bugger this for a lock. 
uh, we got to do something. So I went back to him. He says, well, if there are no features, you have to write one. And it just so happens that day, it rained in Jeddah. And it had not rained for, for years. I mean, Jeddah is not a place that, you know, that sees rain. It hasn't rained for several years. So I wrote this great feature about Jeddah in rain. Uh, and the following day, the newspaper was full of letters because at last the reader saw something that happened in Jeddah because the newspaper <laughs> was full of things which never ever happened in Saudi Arabia, right? And so they had something to talk about. So the, the editor came back to me and said, you wrote, a, you wrote a great feature there last night. And, uh, maybe you should write a regular feature uh, 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 every day or at least every other day so we can get some you know, letters from the, from the editor. So foolishly, I said, okay. But of course, then I sat down and there were no, feats, no features to write. I kept on thinking and there was no features to write. And then one day I sat in my table and a Yemeni guy arrived wearing a lungi and all naked. And I said, what do you want? He says, I've been sent especially for the, for, by the editor to help you to write features. So I looked at him and said, how are you going to help me write features? So he opened a big box of cigars, right? And took out a Churchill size, which is, if you know, it's a huge cigar, stuck it in my mouth, cut it, stuck it in my mouth and lit it. And he says, this will help you write features. <laughs> so I, I had, till that time, I had never ever smoked anything in my life. I was about 27 or 28, 29 or something like that. I had never smoked, put a cigarette or anything. But actually, when I took a few puffs of this, I started feeling and ideas started coming. <laughs> and lo and behold, by the time I had finished this thing, it takes about two, three hours to finish a good Churchill cigar. I had written a whole feature. And when I went the following day, uh, then the Germany was there with a box of cigars, so he stuck another cigar. So this went on about 10, 12 days, and I wrote all sorts of features for this newspaper. And after that, I just collapsed and, and, and had to give up, give up the job. But when I left, the job, I discovered that I was uh, quite liked smoking cigars. Uh, and of course, I hadn't realized that a, a good Churchill cigar costs a large amount of money. Uh, so when I came to London and I went to the Smiths in Tottenham Court Road and bought, I said, I'll take a box, you know, and they said, it is a box, 250 quid. My heart sank, my love God. So, you know, anyway, I bought it. Uh, and since then, till 18 months ago, I smoked two Havana cigars every day. Uh, and uh, fortunately, my books did very well, uh, and I could afford them. Yeah. Right? One book actually sold a million and a half copies, so that was good. You know, probably bought lots of Havana cigars for me. But about 18 months ago, when the economy went down and the books didn't start selling and other contracts start cancelling, it became extremely difficult to uh, smoke Havana cigars. So I said, I'm going to reform myself. Reform myself. Remove the faults that exist in me. And this is a major fault that is also an economic drain. So I'm going to give up Havana cigars. So the following day I got up, and of course I missed my cigar. And uh, normally what would happen is I would smoke a cigar in the morning, which will get me going, and I'd be able to work and write uh, till, you know, uh, six. And then I probably in the evening I'll have one smaller cigar just to relax and all that. And I discovered that I couldn't write without the cigar in my morning cigar, I, I, I needed that. That had become an essential part. And of course, if I can't write, then what use I am, because that's what I do. Uh, so I needed a substitute. And of course, uh, I went to the doctor. He says, well, you, I put you in a, a nice nicotine thingy. So he gave me a nic nicotine thing. So I started chewing. This is what it looks like. I started chewing this, these nicotine things. Um, and six months, eight, eight months later, I discovered that while I enjoyed smoking Havana cigars, I was not actually addicted to them. Because when I went to Pakistan, for example, where there were no Havana cigars, uh, for up to three, four, three months, four, uh, three weeks to four, four months, I would be quite all right. I wouldn't miss them. Uh, I come back to London and I start smoking, or if I go to Indonesia, you know, or I can't find them, it was not a big problem. I mean, it was something that I just took it. Uh, but suddenly I discovered I couldn't live without these things. <laughs> I, had no, I had not been addicted before, but now I was totally addicted. And now I carry, just to show you, about a dozens of these, dozens of these things in my pocket all the time. And if you see me, you find me chewing all the time. So where, where I was not addicted to nicotine, now I am. So, 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 so my attempts at reforming, my attempts to remove the fault within me actually ended up creating new faults and made matters, things, things worse. Now, this is the interesting thing about reform. Reform, the attempt to actually remove faults from a system, does not always lead you 
to positive results. Reform can, in fact, produce negative results, and frequently it does. Now, nowadays, uh, we demand all sorts of reforms. We demand electoral reform, welfare reforms, tax reforms, benefit reforms, banking reforms, reforms of the financial system, and reforms of monarchy, and of course, reform of pensions. This is what the great uh, uh, demonstration, the strike the, uh, yesterday was all about. The government wants to reform pensions. Now, if reform is all about removing errors and faults, then it's all about perceptions of what you think are the errors and faults, because you may see certain things that you regard as errors and faults in a system, while certain other people, from the other perspective, may not see those same things as errors, errors and faults. They may see something else as, as er 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 errors, er errors and faults. Uh, and in the pension debate, of course, we have that. That's, that's what the government is saying. The government is saying that we have to reform the pensions uh, uh, because there are certain faults in the system. One of the main faults is that we don't have enough money, there's too much debt, uh, and the people who are uh, 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 striking, they're saying, well, if you're reforming the system, what, what it means is that we end up paying more, uh, and when we actually retire, we end up getting less. So we have to work longer, we have to pay more, but at the end we get less. So what kind of reform is that? So you see that, that there, are, there are different perceptions of, of the reform. So reform immediately becomes contested. Now, the word itself has its origins in the 14th century England. Uh, and it gained currency uh, during the reformation in the, in the 16th century. And we all know that uh, uh, the re reformation or reformation uh, was all about uh, uh, reforming the doctrines and rituals and the structure of the, of the Roman Catholic Church, and it led to the split of the church itself, and of course, emergence of, the, of Protestant churches. So reform can often lead to divisions. Uh, 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 it depends how, uh, how, how, how people actually see uh, reform. Uh, Nowadays, it's probably the most used and abused words, uh, uh, most used and abused word. By the way, it doesn't occur in Raymond Williams' keywords. So it's, uh, uh, it's something um, that has gained currency nowadays, although it has a very, very long history. Uh, just to give you two examples, there are actually some organizations called Reform. So there's one organization, I was searching on the internet, and I came across the one organization uh, called Reform, uh, established in 1993. Uh, it is a network of individuals and churches that, I quote, is promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ by reforming the Church of England. So even after Reformation, the reform of Church of England continues. Uh, and of course, every time such reforms are made, there are further divisions uh, within the church. There's another uh, organization that also calls itself Reform. Uh, and, but it's a right-wing policy institute that describes itself as, and I quote, an independent, charitable, non-party think tank whose main mission is to set out a better way to deliver public service and economic prosperity, uh, for which we need to promote the interests of business. So it depends uh, 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 what you mean by reform. There are certain words with which, the, with which reform is frequently associated. And there are two specific words uh, uh, which need our attention. Uh, often, the word reform is used for modernization. So for example, reform Judaism uh, started off as a mov movement to modernize Jewish beliefs and practices and make them compatible with modern world. Uh, Many branches of Reform Judaism uh, hold that Jewish law should be interpreted as a set of general guidelines rather than a list of restrictions whose literal observation is required uh, of all Jews. So Reform Judaism simply, in the eyes of those who, who, are, who are Reform Jews, means modernizing Judaism. So Reform and modernization here are almost used synonymously. But the most frequent word that comes, uh, in, uh, that is associated with reform is the word efficiency. Now think of the National Health Service. How many times the National Health Service has been uh, reformed 
since 1950. Every single government that comes into power wants to reform the, the National Health Service. And by reform, they mean they want to improve the efficiency of the National Health Service. Uh, we had targets, they have to deliver targets. Uh, now we have something else. The, the, the uh, conservatives want to reform the National Health Service again. And by reform, they mean uh, basically turn it into, uh, hand it over to the business interests, turn it into a, into a, into a market uh, where uh, uh, you go out and you find the cheapest uh, uh, price you can get for doing whatever you want to do. So, so in a sense, National Health Service has been continuously reformed uh, and the target of this reform has continuously been to improve the efficiency of the National Health Service. Now it is very interesting to note that you can make things efficient to a certain point. The, once you reach a particular point, you reach, uh, you start getting diminishing returns. So the more you make things efficient, the more inefficient they become. This is a very interesting phenomena. Uh, so more reform you introduce, you are not making the system efficient, but you're actually making the system more inefficient. Now the best way to illustrate this is to imagine a two-lane two motorway. You have two-lane motorway and it's all crowded, right? Jam, head-to-head -head cars, head-to-head -head cars. Uh, what do you do? Well, to introduce traffic, you make four laneways. You put two extra laneways. So now you have four laneways. But what happens to the traffic? It doesn't increase, it decreases. It doesn't decrease, it increases. So you end up with four lanes which are all jammed of traffic jam, you know, get, get, uh, head to head cars. What do you do next? Well, you produce two more lanes so that you can reduce traffic and you can reform the con congestion if you like. But, but what happens? Traffic actually increases, it doesn't decrease. Uh, and you make eight lane uh, motor. Uh, uh, and again, yes, you are going to, you assume that by having eight lanes, the system, the, uh, the system will actually improve but in fact, uh, what happens is that the traffic increases. Now, I first discovered that in the said city of Jeddah, uh, uh, where I learned to smoke cigars, um, uh, during the late 70s, when I used to work on the city of Makkah. And the problem there was, how do you get pilgrims from, uh, uh, from Makkah, the holy city, to the various ritual points like Mina, which is a nearby couple of miles, and Arafat, and Muzdalafa, these are the ritual points that the pilgrims have to move. And of course, they said, hell of a lot of congestions, we only got two motor, uh, two lanes, we're gonna put four lanes. So they put four lanes, of course, the congestion increased, and then they put six lanes, the congestion increased. And I saw that visually in front of my eyes, and they increased, and then put eight lanes, and the con congestion, in congestion increased. Uh, so this effect, where you try to reform things, and make them more and more efficient. But in fact, in reality, they become more and more inefficient. It's called the Jeevan's paradox. It was first discovered, uh, where is that bit? I lost that bit. Uh, yeah, it's called the Jeevan's paradox. So this first discovered by William Stanley Jeevan's in 1865, would you believe, in relation to coal. Uh, and it has been recently used to show that, that drives for, for efficiencies and reforms in numerous areas, such as fos, uh, fossil fuels, make matters worse rather than better. The reform of agriculture in India, for example, uh, did not actually increase efficiency of food production. Uh, production. Uh, neither did it solve the problem of hunger. In fact, it made it worse. Uh, not least by reducing seed varieties. So all the green revolution in India that went on through the 80s and 90s and up to early part of, the, uh, part of this century, all the agriculture reforms which were designed to increase food production actually led to decrease in food production. Uh, um, and we can see that in, in everyday things. Now fridges, for example, they become more efficient and they, 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 they become bigger and therefore they are used more, and therefore their efficiency actually you know, goes down. Uh, the promotion of energy efficiency at the micro level 
that's uh, household and individual consumers, increases energy consumption at the macro level of the whole society. And that's the kind of phenomenon that we, uh, that, that, that we find. So reform can be very, very problematic, especially if it is associated with terms like modernization and efficiency. Uh, and a clear example, I think, is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the NHS. Uh, it has now reached the end of its reformed life. It cannot be reformed any, any, any further. There's, 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 no, there's no way you can actually increase the efficiency of, of the National Health Service. The, the, the more you attempt to reform it, the more, in fact, it will become uh, uh, less efficient and, and less effective. Uh, there are other uh, 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 words associated with reform as well. For example, when corporations talk of reform, what do they mean? Uh, well, what they mean is that profit is decreasing. So when they are reforming uh, the corporations, uh, what they want to do is to increase profit, which means they, have to they need to have larger control of the market and have better management. And this is a very common phenomenon. Every time the word reform actually occurs in a, in a corporation or in a business, the first thing they want to do is to improve management. And of course, what does that mean, improve management? Well, at the end of the day, management are people. So they want to improve people. Uh, they want to improve the efficiency of people. You know, they want to make them work harder or, or, or longer or, or cheaper or, or do whatever it ne necessary to get a, 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 a greater productivity out of them. So when corporations think of reform, it's, 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 it's a different phenomenon. So reform has a context. When people use the word reform, the first thing you need to do is to check what is the context of, of, uh, of the reform they are talking about. And the second thing you need to check is whether this reform is actually going to lead to things being improved, or in fact, will it lead to things being made worse. Uh, and, and if the words modernize, modernization or efficiency are, are connected with it, then you can guarantee that the reform is designed. Well, it may not be designed, but the end product of the reform that is being int introduced uh, actually means that things will become more efficient and not necessarily better. Um, in the Muslim community itself, the word reform has a long, long history. Uh, and it goes right back uh, uh, to, to 12th century. And often the word reform in, in Islam is associated with the word revival. Uh, uh, and when uh, uh, conventionally justified uh, by a very famous tradition of the, of the Prophet, although I'm not sure whether it's an authentic tradition, uh, which says that there will be reformers in my ummah, that is my community, every 100 years. Uh, so we have a very long kind of history of these reformers, and they go back to uh, the 12th century. I, I suspect one of the most uh, uh, famous book of revival or reform that all Muslims have heard of is, uh, is Al-Ghazali's The Revival of Religious Sciences in Islam, which everybody uh, uh, reads. I mean, a massive 30 volumes. You don't pro they probably don't read all 30 volumes, but they certainly read things like the Book of Knowledge and the Book of Prayer and the Book of Fasting and, 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 and things like that. And Al-Ghazali in the 12th century uh, looked around the Muslim world and said, my God, this is a rotten lot and we need to reform them. And he set about reforming them uh, and he produced, uh, as I said, Ilai uh, in the Deen, the Revival of Religious Knowledge in Islam, which became a, 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 a standard text. Uh, for after him, there have been numerous other reform, reformists uh, this famous uh, political philosopher Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, who uh, after Ghazali also looked at the Muslim world and said, my God, this is a rotten lot, uh, we need to reform them. And so he then introduced his own ideas of, uh, of, of reform, till right to, the, uh, to our time. In the last 50, 60 years, we've had a number of reformist movement uh, in the Muslim world, uh, some specifically talking about reform, like Jamaat Islami in Pakistan, uh, which has been wanting to reform Islam uh, for the last 50 years. Uh, and by, by reform, it simply means that the Muslims are not very good. Both their, their beliefs are weak, 
and their actions are not ethical, and the only way to, to, to do something about them is to, is to make sure that their beliefs are correct uh, and, uh, and they behave properly, and the only way to make sure that they behave properly is to have Sharia or Islamic law in a, in a state. So when they're talking about Islam, they're, they're, uh, sorry, reform in Islam, they're talking about creating an Islamic state uh, in which Sharia is the, is, the, is the law of the land, and uh, uh, the state is essentially a kind of a semi-religious theology, if not a full theology. And of course, there are various reformist movements in, been in, 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 uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the Arab world associated with this, such names as Jamaluddin Afghani and, and Mohammed uh, uh, Abdu, the famous mufti of, of of, of Al-Azhar University in the 19th century. Uh, uh, they wanted to reform Islam basically as a instrument or as a form of resistance against colonialism. Uh, and they saw Muslims as, 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 uh, as, as decadent in terms of intellectual thought. And the idea was that if we can do something about the way Muslims think and reform the, the mode of thinking, then maybe we can uh, resist colonialism, modernize Muslim societies and, 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 and move forward. So in different cultures, reform may mean even, may have even more drastically different meaning in, in, uh, than, than we find, than we find in, uh, in the West. Uh, of course, we have uh, at this moment, uh, reform movements going on all over the uh, Arab world. They don't specifically describe themselves as reform movements. Uh, we have what is known as Arab Spring, and in fact, uh, 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 what we have seen in Egypt, in uh, uh, Libya, in Tunisia, and to some extent in Bahrain, Syria, and, and, and Yemen, are kind of movements that are, that, are, that are trying to change the system. But it's interesting that they don't use the word reform. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they, it, it's not like that they want to simply play and tinker with, with the system and make it more efficient or make it more uh, uh, humane. They actually want to o overthrow the system. But it is also very interesting that they don't use the word revolution, in a sense, because Often people associate reform with revolution, but although the, these are two different words and have, they have two different histories and genealogies and they mean two different, different things. Uh, uh, and it, it is quite fascinating that they haven't actually used a, any particular label to do what they're doing. And we have been stuck. We describe them as, as uh, uprisings, uh, uh, you know, revolts. Uh, the genetic term we use is, is, is Arab Spring which suggests that it's, it has a limited time scale because the spring only lasts three months, you know, it's followed by uh, uh, a summer, which is followed by autumn and, and, and then winter. So now when things have started going wrong, people have started talking about Arab autumn. Uh, uh, and I suppose when things really get heated up, they will start talking about Arab summer. Uh, and finally, when the whole thing kind of reaches a kind of a stalemate of some kind, it will become, a, you know, it will be a Arab winter and then there'll be a thaw at the end of the day and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, so we don't even, ha we don't have a language of actually talking about what's happening in the, in, the, in, the, in the Arab Spring, which is very, very interesting. And the reason for that, I think, is following, is that in contemporary times, uh, change has become very problematic. Uh, conventionally, Change was something that took its time. Uh, even revolutions, uh, like the revolution, say, for example, the October 17 revolution, you know, required a great deal of planning. There was lots of preparation, and, and you know, it, it, it took some time to actually get going, and then had you know, uh, to, to implement it and reach some sort of conclusion. Even the say, Iranian Revolution of '79 was planned for almost a decade, you know, before uh, before uh, Ayatollah finally arrived from Paris in Tehran. Uh, but what is happening nowadays is uh, is that change is very, very rapid. See, change is kind of the whole n nature of change has itself changed. 
So change is now much faster, more rapid, and there's an acceleration of change. In fact, the rate of acceleration itself is accelerating in a sense. So change is almost in instantaneous and almost kind of a, a rap uh, so rapid that people cannot really adjust to the, to, to the kind of change. Uh, we also live in a very globalized world where there's interconnection. You know, if something happens in Tahrir Square at this moment in time, you'll be able to see it instantaneously on Sky News or BBC or, or Al Jazeera or, or nowadays, of course, uh, Russia Today or France 24 and all sorts of international channels that you can actually see that event. So the events, uh, there's an instantaneity about it. And when things are interconnected and instantaneous, they become very, very complex. And when things are complex, you have a thing called feedback. In other words, things multiply quickly, and you have positive feedback. And once you have positive feedback, things become very, very chaotic. And we saw that uh, in, in, in the Arab Spring, that things moved very, very quickly, and they reached a chaotic proportion very, very fast, uh, uh, to an extent that uh, the, the dictators didn't know what to do. And in fact, in Tunisia, the, he, he you know, more or less uh, 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 the, the president decided to, to, to save himself and, and decided to exit you know, the, the, po the political scene. Uh, uh, but even Mubarak in, 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 in Egypt didn't actually believe that he, that he could be brought down. I mean, dictators do uh, have a, uh, are dictators for, for some reason. I mean, they put a mechanism in place that, that ensures that they survive. There's their instruments there that, that keep them in, 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 in power. So they don't, they, he didn't believe that things will change so rapidly. And, and, and as a result, uh, you know, he could not control the, what, what, what was going on and, and found himself out in the air. Uh, so when you have a situation like that, it doesn't really make sense to talk of a reform. Reform always is gradual, takes time. Uh, or you know, over a period, it involves certain amount of kind of discussion and negotiation, if you like. Uh, so, what's happening in the in the in the in the Arab world is not reform in the uh, uh, as we understand it. And the word itself has has almost become redundant, if you like, uh, uh, in the kind of world we find ourselves. And I describe it as a post-normal world, in, in in a world where normal things do not hold. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to talk about reform. It has to be something completely uh, different. Uh, so that thing that is completely different, I would say, uh, is a critical state of mind. I mean, uh, in a sense, what we need is not so much to reform institutions or to talk about reform, uh, although the word itself will continue to exist. Uh, uh, what we need to do is to stand back and take a, take a critical distance and look at things critically. Uh, and, the, and the word that makes much more sense to me, uh, I've, I've been defined, uh, described as a reformist writer, a writer that I've been writing, you know, uh, stuff that argues that we should reform Islam, we should reform the West, and so on and so forth. Actually, I've not been doing anything of the sort. Uh, uh, but sometimes people hold up one article I wrote called, uh, it was called, uh, uh, reform and Muslim intellectuals or something like that and say, oh, you wrote that article on reform. But even in that article, I wasn't actually talking about reform in that sense. What I do is to write from a critical point of view. And I don't mean critical theory point of view, I mean critical point of view in the old fashion of criti criticism and argument and analysis and synthesis, looking at things you know, critically from different perspectives and, and, and different positions. I think that's where we need to move, to move towards is to look at things critically. And when we start looking at things critically, uh, one of the first things we do is to look at context. So anybody talks about reform, the first thing we want to do is to, well, what context is this person talking about reform? What, what, is, what does he or she identify as, as faults and errors in the system? And do I also agree that these really are the faults and errors in the system that need to be changed? Or do I think that there are other faults and errors in the system that, that need to be changed? So I think we need to move from a kind of reformist kind of mentality to, to a more critical uh, outlook and, and, and critical engagement. As I said, uh, even the best reforms frequently end up in making things worse. But given the 
kind of time that we find ourselves, where change is rapid, uh, uh, and where reform is frequently identified with modernization and with efficiency. The system itself is designed in such a way uh, that more reforms we attempt, the more inefficient we make the system. So basically, I think it's time to stand back and stop reforming things. I've learned from my uh, own little exercise that now I'm ad addicted to these bloody things. And the reform that I try to introduce in myself has actually not just backfired, but made things damn sight worse. Forgive me if I chew this. Thank you very much. I, f I find that a little bit surprising. I thought that Ziauddin Sardar was going to give us a pro-reform talk, and he ended up giving us an anti-reform talk. But maybe just sit there and accept everything. I don't know. We'll come. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll have a go at this. Um, I will ask a few questions or bring up a few points. Um, because we've got such a small, intimate little gathering here, it might be useful if if we start talking about one thing. Before we go off onto another topic, if you have something to ask or to add about the topic that we're on, put your, put your hand up and I'll, I'll, I'll ask your, um, what you want to say before we move on, okay? So feel free to, to jump in. Um, I'll start off with revolution and reform. Mm -hmm. These two words which are very often, they're sometimes placed in opposition to each other rather than going together they're, they're, as two options. Are you going to do the, go down the reform route or are you going to have a revolution? Um, first, about the Arab winter term. I saw that today. I was uh, having a train journey today and I was at one point standing looking at a rack of magazines. I can't remember if it was The Economist or The New Statesman. It was one of them had Arab winter on the front and pictures of, I suppose... So we, we already missed, we already the, missed the summer then? We've missed the summer, that's gone. Right. Um, it went straight to winter, which is a bit silly because it's this assumption that revolutions are something easy and quick and fast and that they're all nice and that you, you get positive results immediately. Um, I beg to differ. I think that the terms like Arab Spring and Arab w Winter now, these are terms that have not been... I haven't... In Arabic, I haven't come across the term Arab Spring. Have you? Uh, I think in Al Jazeera they mention it. They mention it in Al Jazeera, okay. I, I, I mean, in conversations, I don't see people talking about the Arab Spring. They're talking about revolution, which I think is a much better name. They're talking about the Egyptians definitely call what's happening in their country a revolution, which we're now in stage two of the, the revolution there. The Libyans, you can disagree. You can talk, some people, rather stupidly, I think, say that as soon as Britain and France started bombing, it stopped being a revolution and it became a... a I, I don't agree with that, I think, infantile leftist point of view. I think it is a revolution. The Libyans certainly talk about what's happening in their country in terms of a revolution. The Tunisians talk about the revolution in their country. The Bahrainis, who support it, um, talk about a, a revolution or an attempted revolution, at least in Bahrain. And the Syrians are talking about revolution. They're using the word thawra, and all of the coordinating committees which are being set up, a lot of them use the word revolution in their titles. Um, but it's, what's being done in, in, in Syria is that supporters of the Syrian regime will um, say, why don't you want reform? Why, why do you want to bring us into these dangerous, this dangerous territory? Why aren't you accepting the reforms which the regime is, is now suggesting as if you're an unreasonable person if you're supporting the revolution because there is a reform route. So in, in that, as a propaganda ploy, reform is often set as the kind of the nice, stable, sensible thing that a reasonable person would accept. Mm -hmm. The revolutionaries are saying, no, I mean, first of all, we don't believe you. Your reforms are meaningless. Bashar al-Assad announced some months ago, he announced the end of the emergency law and that people could apply to have demonstrations. The next day was a Friday, somebody applied to have a demonstration, he was arrested, nobody's seen him since, um, and 120 people were murdered that day. So they're using reform as a propaganda ploy, it just means shut up and accept things, that it's not, it's not real. And sometimes I think we have to say that the situation is so bad, a system is so rotten, it's proved itself to be so rotten that we have to just rip the whole thing up and start again from the beginning. That's the revolutionary 
idea. So do you have anything to, 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 to add there to that opposition of the two yeah, words, I mean, revolution and reform? Yeah, I think reform and revolutions are frequently used uh, in, I mean, uh, as opposition. And normally, we would distinguish between reforms, which was supposed to be gradual. It's a, reform is, is gradual change, and revolution is, is, is a major upturn, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense. I mean, uh, it involves over, overturning. And um, I will caution uh, the use of the word revolution in Arab Spring, because revolutions, as we know, in the history of revolutions, end up devouring their own children. Uh, and uh, in my own kind of personal life, uh, I was a very strong supporter of the Iranian revolution, you know, right from the beginning. And when these questions arise, what will happen, you know, if we follow a French revolution or or the Russian Revolution, you know, things could become very nasty. We were told, oh, this is the Islamic Revolution. It's going to be different. We are Muslims, you know. We, you know, This is almost saying that we are opting out of history. Somehow the laws of history do not apply to us. But exactly the same thing happened, you know. The Iranian Revolution ended up devouring its own, its own children. And frequently, the, the, the revolutions uh, replace one dictator uh, with another. Uh, uh, the revolutionary leader uh, actually becomes a, 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 if you like, a new dictator. Now, I would say that these things are not revolutions in classical sense. What is happening in the Arab world is are not revolutions in classical sense. Revolutions are always led by a charismatic leader with a vision. Here, we have networks of people with no distinguishable leaders. And part of their success of the Arab Spring is the fact that they are networks and do not have you know, uh, 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 recognizable leaders. Now, uh, quite frequently, the revolutions can be stopped uh, pretty effectively if you sim simply single out the leader and, 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 and kind of kill him, if you like. Or, uh, and, and the, and the, and the revo revo revolution uh, dissipates. Um, uh, but this movement, I don't think, can be stopped as easily because it is, a, it, is a, it, it is a network. So we have a real problem. I don't think it's a revolution. I don't think it's a reform, right? Uh, so what exactly I I it is? In fact, when I was writing the introduction to that, I thought about it a lot, how to, how to describe it, because it's clearly not a conventional revolution. And it's not a reformist movement in the, in, in, in the classical sense. It's certainly not a reformist movement in, this, in the Islamic sense, in the way that it has reformic, reform movements have come out in, hist in, in Islamic history. Uh, for one thing, the reformist movements in Islamic history tend to be very Puritan. Well, there's no Puritanism here. Uh, for another thing, they tend to be, uh, have very fixed goals, you know, uh, uh, improve the Muslims you know, make them better Muslims, you know, by whatever means you can, and bring in Islamic law. Well, these demands are not there at all, in a sense. So they are not classical uh, reformist movements uh, uh, either. Um, so they're totally a different phenomena. And I think the, the, the certain words uh, have lost their meaning, in, in a sense. Uh, um, and when people describe me as a reformist, I'm quite horrified sometimes, because in a, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is to actually both uh, kind of dismantle various kind of structures of power uh, uh, and try and do that without violence mm. uh, and, and transform the system and take it to a new position. I don't want to reform it in that sense. I'm more about transformation. And transformation takes the system from one place and places it in completely different. And sometimes I use the word transmodernity in the sense it's, it's trans over and above uh, what modernity and postmodernism has talked about. I think um, I think I'll still stick with the word revolution. We need a definition of the word revolution that we can argue about, maybe. But I, 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 I certainly take your points. This is a new kind of phenomenon. It is leaderless, and if it in many countries, if it if it had or all of these countries, if it had had defined leaders, then it would have been able they would have been able to crush it much earlier. Um, I would still call it a revolution because I, uh, certainly we don't know where we're going, but at the moment it does look like a, a total revolving of, of order in, in the society. On a psychological and symbolic level, as whatever we end up with politically and economically and religiously and culturally, on the, psych on the psychological level, is a revolution. Um, 
an obvious example for me is in Syria, when I lived there, which isn't that long ago, what's happening now is, was just unthinkable. I remember the first gasps of this in February. They say the revolution started in March, but the first sign was in February when there was a, a, an example of police brutality in the Souk in central Damascus. And the, there was an, uh, an, a sudden, came out of nowhere, spontaneous, it seemed, demonstration of the shopkeepers in this area. Um, and they weren't calling for the fall of the regime, but they started chanting, the Syrian people won't be humiliated. I remember that. Just yeah. the ability to, sp to speak. To s people didn't used to dare to speak critically in their own houses, yeah. Yeah. With yeah. in front of their own children, yeah. because they were scared that their children would go to school and repeat what they'd heard in the house, and there would be terrible uh, ramifications. I think this, this is the point. The, uh, the point I'm making is that, uh, that there is critical thinking involved here. There is critical yeah, thinking, yeah. but the, the that's what makes it ex the, exciting for me as well. And the, I think that's the why the drama of the change, though, yeah. the suddenness of this change. It seems yeah. as if the society as a whole, not just leaders or parties, but society as a whole, has come to a, a watershed. It's come to a point where, um, and, and whether the outcome is the final outcome is good or bad, and of course it'd be a mixture of both. Um, I think that's what I would call revolutionary. Whatever we're however we define the word, it seems to be on a, on, a, on a psychological, symbolic level, it seems to be a revolutionary change that things have, there's been a logjam and a stagnation for so long, and that's broken, that even when they're torturing children to death, people are not scared anymore. They've kind of gone beyond, that seems like a revolutionary change in the psychology of the society. Yeah. People have things to say about this topic. Yes, the gentleman. You don't need a... I just want to add to the, the, the difference between probably revolution and reform is the agent in terms of the reform is, is in, in more cases a, is an internal thing where the, per, where the system wants to change itself, where the person wants to change itself. But in, with revolutions, it's, it's less of an internal thing. It's more of an external agent saying, asking for the change and, and demanding for a, for a change. Mm. And, 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 to me that, and, and to me, therefore, the Adam Spring does seem to be then a revolution because it's an external agent and as you said while the yeah, but, but reform also reform also frequently has external agent i mean you, you, uh, i was talking about reform in the national health service i mean it's the, the, the reformists are al almost always politicians mm. right of other labor party or conservative party and they're external agent uh, agents of, of, of reform so it, it need not be that reform is something internal uh, uh, and revolutions can be very internal as well. They, they, you know, they, 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 they need not be a kind of a, uh, brought in from the outside. Uh, certainly, what is happening in the, in the Arab world is very internal at the moment. Uh, uh, I mean, nobody asked people in, in, uh, in Egypt to, you know, uh, from outside to go out in Tahrir Square, uh, Square and start you know, demonstrating and occupying, occupying the territory square in that True, sense. but I was thinking more in terms of, of the established government and the, and the power and, and as the other agent is the other people as another entity. The and regime so was forced to change rather, <laughs> or to go, <laughs> rather than deciding to reform yeah. itself. Exactly, but in yeah. Syria, as you were saying, the, the, the regime was, was trying to make changes within itself yeah. and in terms of the system, but then um, the people as the other agent. And I was to add to another issue that you were talking about the change, in, I mean, revolutions always were led by a charismatic figure. Yeah. And I was thinking maybe there's a reformation in revolutions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. good point. Yeah. 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 Reformed yeah. revolutions. Right, next, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yes, please. Uh, I was just wondering whether uh, I, I, reform actually sometimes needs to follow revolution in order for there to be successful transformation. And they're not actually oppositional. And the failures of revolutions are when there is a revolution, which is that watershed moment you were talking about where people are no longer scared and, and are going out and demanding change. But then if there is not, if you like, a sort of structural reform and, and someone there or a group of people there to, to, to uh, structurally change the system rather than to just overturn the previous individuals who are running a system, then transformation doesn't happen. So for example, uh, the, the example I was thinking of was actually the American Revolution where there was a revolution, but it actually was a successful one um, and led to, uh, follow, was followed by a reformation and the laying down of the new laws and the new way they were going to democratically govern themselves. And, mm. and that, that has been a, a, a successful one. Similarly, the, the, or less, less successfully, but you, know, you can also look at the French Revolution mm. as something that had a long-term 
legacy mm. because of their ability to reform after the revolution. <coughs> it is it is it is frequent I mean reform frequently follows a revolution. After a revolution there will always be people who said we need to reform. And the problem arises that these reformists are then labeled counter revolutionaries. And the revolution then moves against the counter revolutionaries who want to reform the revolution. And that's how in fact the revolution devours devours its own children in in, in a sense. Uh, so th there has to be a mechanism that prevents that kind of conflict uh, from from uh, from actually uh, uh, rising, but 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 sure. It, I mean, it, it, with a successful revolution, if they can, <laughs> if I just um, um, so there is that revolt, and then people uh, come in and they say we 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 have overturned the rev revolution was the overturning of a previous, you know, ill government, ill individual. Now we must change what how they governed in order for there to be transformation. And so it's not reformers reforming the revolution, it's reformers reforming pre-revolution. Does that, is that not, I mean, that's well, what I, I was mean, uh, well What is the point of reforming pre-revolution when the, when the revolution has totally already reformed that, in a sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I, I also disagree with, 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 with Robin in the sense that this is not a revolution. The revolution totally, uh, uh, brings the structures of power totally down, right? It totally transforms the, the political structures of, 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 of society. The Arab Spring has not done that. In fact, to do that uh, will be, in my opinion, very destructive. You need certain institutions in society. You need to preserve certain institutions in society so that after the uprising, you can continue uh, with things like security, police, the banking system, and 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 and, 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 and what have you, and which is what has happened in in in, in Tunisia. In 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 many sense, the 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 structures of of, of states have continued, uh, uh, which then itself the, that itself may become problematic later on, as we are seeing, for for example, in in in, in Egypt, the first phase of the so-called revolution. Uh, the dictator was rem was removed, but the structure that he had uh, 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 developed w remained intact. So they simply the military simply took over. In fact, Mubarak himself was from from, from the military. So he removed the figurehead, but but the the institutions of the, of the military continued, and the same practices then continued in a sense. Yeah. Right. So now you got to do something about that. Yeah. Uh, so the next phase is to remove, remove, the, re remove the military. What will happen if you remove the military? Uh, well, I mean, you could have the, the other e society, society elites <coughs> come in. You could have the police, uh, which is still intact, you know, moving in to try and, try and preserve some of, his, some of his power. But the military itself is involved in business and has 40% business interest in the country. I mean, it produces 40, controls 40% of the GDP, right? Even if you remove them in power, you can't really kind of distangle them from their business. They may come back in, in economic terms. So I think you've got lots and lots of kind of complicated problems. Although, as we said, I mean, you said that, what did you say, revolutions require a lot of preparation time. Yeah. And I think yeah. these have required, I th you could say, I mean, there's four, t there's four decades of preparation <laughs> have gone into the moment that we're seeing now. It's not, no, it's not. Yeah, no, I, no, mean, I, would in, totally, in, totally, in I would totally disagree with that. There, was, there, was, no, there, was, no, there was no preparation whatsoever during, during those four, uh, four decades. Even the people who led the, the uprising did not know that they will succeed so quickly. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's they had true. no idea that they will succeed. So they were just as shocked. I mean, people in Tahrir Square were just as shocked that they have brought down Mubarak as Mubarak himself, in, in, in a sense. But that and, doesn't and you mean could that see they weren't preparing. I mean, absolutely, I completely and totally agree with you. The revolutionary moment took, I think, everybody by surprise, and the revolutionaries most of all. But um, nevertheless, in Egypt, I could go, you can go further back, but in Egypt, the, for certainly there have been mass demonstrations in um, Egypt over the last decade in response to um, foreign policy issues. There was mass demonstrations at the time of the crushing of the Second Intifada, um, which turned into, for the first time, 
public demonstrations in which people were chanting against Mubarak as a facilitator of Israeli crimes. There were huge demonstrations in Cairo and Alexandria um, in 2003 at the time of the invasion of Iraq. And again, the subtext, sometimes hidden, sometimes not that hidden, was that we're talking about a foreign, a foreign policy or a regional issue, but we're angry with our government for facilitating this and for not doing anything about it. Mm. So there was um, mass organization going on there and the public expression of discontent with the regime going on over the last, certainly in the war on terror years or going since 2001. Um, in terms of the workers' movement, I think the final thing which got rid of Mubarak was not the crowd in Tahrir Square, it was the um, general strike which was spreading. There were strikes in every section of the Egyptian economy all over the country. Um, everybody was going on strike in the last couple of days. It's at that point when the military moved in and got rid of him. And um, it's that which will, if the military is going to be un turfed out of its present spot, it will be mass strikes that that do it again. Now that strike movement and the movement to develop independent unions has been going on over the past decade and certainly since 2008 when in Mahal al Qubra there was a big strike um, which was viciously put down but, it, but the idea of setting up independent unions independent of the state um, and, 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 and unionists and workers talking to each other in, from in different factories, different towns, different regions um, that's been developing for a while. In retrospect, we can see how it's been coming. You can do it to a lesser extent in other co Arab countries too. In retrospect, but the, the revolutionary moment, that's right, nobody ex expected it to come when it came. But then 1917, I think, might well have been the same thing. I don't know if the revolutionaries, I don't think they could predict the actual date. We'll see, before you, let me go to yeah, the lady who's been holding that for ages. Go one, um, yeah, I was going to say that as well, that before, everyone thinks a revolution is impossible before it happens, isn't that how it normally happens? And also I have heard about the strikes as well. Um, and the second thing I was going to say was, in relation to talking about it being leaderless and um, having a critique of power, could we not think of the word that the reason why it's a different type of revolution is because it's more anarchistic? that it is a revolution, but it's yeah. on, more, on more anarchistic lines than... Yeah, I, I, I would say that, that anarchy has played a very important part, but I wouldn't call it anarchy, I would call it chaos, uh, in the sense that it's chaotic behavior. Uh, now, um, Robin just said that uh, uh, there was a moment when the, the unionists started talking to each other and they wanted to set up unions independent of, or, or, you know, of, the, of the state. How did the unionists start talking to each other? Why couldn't they do that la over the last 40 years? Because now we had the modes of communication that did not exist over the last four years. It was much easier for them to talk to each other. They could send emails, they could send texts, they had, they had mobiles, they, there was no need for face-to-face -face communication. Now, the f uh, I think it is very, very important to appreciate that technology, the, the social uh, networking technology, played a vital role in the, the, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, in my opinion, and I know Robin totally disagrees with me that on that, could not have happened 10 years ago, right? Uh, this is the particular moment uh, and the o only moment that Arab Spring could have happened because of, 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 of the kind of technological tools that were available. Now what these technological tools do is because of the rapid communication and the feedback loops, they create state of anarchy or, or chaotic movement. And it's that chaotic movement that in fact uh, scares the, 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 the dictators. Dictators like to control things and manage things. Now chaos is one thing they cannot control. Chaos is all about uncertainty. Then nobody knows what's gonna happen next. And that's where the system collapses. Yeah, but but but, peop but, 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 but people could have but people could have been organized to change ten years ago as well, and they prob yeah. probably probably were and twenty years. But without the tools, they could not yeah. kind of do it that. The tools were essential. It's not the revolution in itself; it is just a tool for facilitating something. It's not the way that people were associating with each other is what changed. And yeah. That's what made it by the way, we got we got a, we got a brilliant piece by Anne Alexandra on 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 how how uh, uh, Facebook's and, and we'll similar technology was we'll used. We'll next. He's going to speak next. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I probably don't need a microphone, but... Uh, <laughs> Hello? 
Oh, yeah. oh right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay then. Yeah. Um, uh, just, I think, I think two very quick points, and they probably touch on what what you've mentioned. But I think that any discussion of of a revolution is a bit like trying to analyze a beard. Well, how many hairs make the beard? Um, at some point, you have a beard. It, but al it also <laughs> depends on the nature of the beard and the, and, and the context of the beard and the function of the beard. Uh, they are all different things. If yes. you, as, as a Muslim, you know, a tablighi jamaat beard yes. looks <laughs> totally different from a, jamaat, <laughs> from a Muslim brotherhood beard, and it looks yes. totally different from a Qadiani or a Saudi beard, yes. right? And, and you, know, the, you know, I could do it. You it, shouldn't it, have said it, beard. I, I shouldn't have said yeah, beard. I know, I'm sorry. I, I could give you a no whole beard variety. beard metaphors, please. Yeah, I could give you a whole Kind of, kind of a topology of, of, of a beard. So it's not just the hair, but it's also the shape and, you know, and what the beard represents. Because many people speak through their beards. And, and some diet as well. Yeah, Let's yeah. not I mean, get into I that. Mean, you know, you, you, if you have a certain kind of beard, you're, you're going to be stopped in an in, in American airport, right? And, and, and be singled out. Uh, for special treatment. I think we've extended Wasim's metaphor too far. Go on, Wasim. Um, well, th the point I wanted to make really is that talk about reform and even about being critical mm. as, as, as if they're two different opposites. These, bo these are both things which I think require some kind of an agency, some kind of a, a conscious decision to either step back and look at something or to just dive in there and start trying to tinker and fix it. Mm. But the nature of revolutions, if we look at all the revolutions from, from the French Revolution to the Russian Revolution to mm. what we're calling the Arab Spring here, mm. not one of these was ever actually planned. I mean, the storming I mean, I in France, it just reached a point where people were enough ab about the price of bread and about their living standards. The ideologies came later. The same thing with in, 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 in the Soviet, well, it wasn't even the Soviet Russian, the Russian Revolution. Lenin, about a week or so before it all kicked off, he was in Switzerland and he, was, he actually wrote a paper thinking, when will we actually see a revolution in Russia? He had no idea that within two weeks he's going to be taking a train back to Moscow or St. Petersburg, I think. And, and the same thing over here in, in January. I mean, wh when I came back from, from I was in, in Syria in February. And, and the incident you're talking about was actually early March, and I actually landed in London a few days before then, and people were asking me in London, do you think there's going to be a revolution in Syria? And I said, not in a million years, there wasn't a sign of that. Within days, there was the first protest in Damascus, and then all of a sudden it kicked off somewhere else because some ch school children were treated badly. And I, I think the conditions for a revolution, it's a bit like a plant, at some point, it's a seed, you can throw it anywhere, but it will only grow where there's enough water, there's enough light, and there's enough uh, and the right soil the texture. And th this brings us to something very interesting, which is that in every revolution, there was something which frightened the authorities or the regimes. I mean, at the time of the French Revolution, probably, or, or let's say the Reformation, when, when, when the church was forced to reform itself, one of the big things was the church had a big list of books to ban, and they would burn these books or they would stop them. And the fact that there was the Gutenberg press and there's the printing press, and that started spreading the Bible and, and other books with strange ideas amongst the populace. And that was very, very dangerous. Mm. Um, looking forward towards the 20th century, one of the big things, if you wanted a revolution, the first thing you did was you took over the radio station and the television station. And then you try to ban, like with Syria, they'd ban broadcasts from Iraq. Uh, which would be subversive, or uh, you know, the Israelis, they, they, you know, they'd have the, you'd have the voice of America and the Soviet Union. <laughs> so that was another thing which was very important for the 20th century. Once the regimes got comfortable with that, we wouldn't see anything until now. You would have probably Bashar Assad sitting there thinking, why on earth is Twitter and Facebook a problem? Why is that bothering me? Why does, uh, uh, recently, Walid Muallim, the Syrian foreign minister, there's a spoof going out on the Twitter sphere, which I, I know Robin doesn't like, but I, I regularly follow it. Uh, and there was a spoof going around that Walid Muallim had announced, there was an account which looked very realistic, but nobody took seriously, but you weren't sure. And that, that had a very official sounding announcement saying that uh, um, he's announced his resignation. Um, the, uh, the regime mouthpieces all instantly said that is not true, no foreign ministry staff uh, have any kind of Twitter accounts. There's a person who was in the embassy here called Mr. Magdisi, Jihad Magdisi. He actually came on his Twitter account to say that that's not true. The foreign minister doesn't have a Twitter account. <laughs> they took it very seriously. It was, it was a very important thing. Yeah. You go to yeah. Syria, YouTube is blocked and, yeah. and Facebook yeah. is blocked and the yeah. same in many Arab yeah. countries. Yeah. So uh, I to cut a long story short, perhaps it's more like a seed revolution rather than some process that requires agency. Uh, and that's what's uh, amazing, because once you sprinkle the seeds, if, if they're in the right place, with the right conditions, then it'll grow. And if we look at it in this organic way, rather than some kind of method that needs agency, maybe we can see something in a different light. Mm. Mm. Good point. I, yeah. I must just say that I, I, I um, don't completely disagree with what Zia said about the importance of the social 
networks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't disagree with that at all. In fact, I think that one of the reasons why this has been a pan-Arab phenomenon, this revolution of this year and beginning this year and going on for many years into the future, I think, um, one of the roots of that is the setting, the establishment of of, of pan-Arab satellite TV, which happened. When did it, when did Jazeera start off? How long ago is it now? Fifteen years ago. I mean, I mean, I remember actually a couple of years ago having a debate with somebody who said, "What's wrong with the Arabs?" When Jazeera set up, everybody was writing articles about how this uncontrollable free satellite media would suddenly change everything and it would bring a democratization. And what's wrong with them? Nothing's changed. It's all exactly the same. And 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 I remember saying, I, I didn't know all of this was coming, but I I'm proud that I said at the time, "Well, wait. These are l historical processes that." It takes a long time to see things are changing, but you're not going to... Things really changed. That at, at, it, My wife, for example, who grew up in Syria, um, I remember talking to her about the um, 1991 Iraq-Kuwait war and talking about things which I thought everybody in the images that I thought everybody in the world had in their heads. Like, you remember the Amriya shelter, the, the horrible... the there was a shelter where there were lots of families hiding from the bombs and, and bunker-busting missiles went in there and burnt everybody to death. Um, that was something that we all knew about. My wife had never heard of that. Um, the pictures of the flight when the Iraqis and lots of civilians too, the Iraqi soldiers and lots of civilians were running out of Kuwait in the last days of the war on the Basra Road and that was carpet-bombed and we had very dramatic pictures of the... The, the burnt skulls in the, in the, in the vehicles and, and so on. She'd never heard of any of that because it was all, at the time, you only had access to Syrian TV in Syria and Syrian state TV wasn't showing it, didn't want the people to know about this. Um, now, of course, something happens in, somebody gets, is murdered in Homs in Syria and immediately the YouTube video is seen all, the, all over the world it's not, it's not the board, the Arab world does not have fixed borders around it. We are seeing it too. But the Arabs, if something is on Al Jazeera, everybody from Morocco to <coughs> Bahrain and from Sudan to Lebanon sees that news bulletin. So there's a common vocabulary. As soon as mm. they come up with a slogan in Tunisia, kids in Dera start writing that slogan, revolutionary slogan on the wall because they've just okay. seen it on the news, it's exciting, they write yeah. it on the yeah. wall. Yeah. So in that sense, I agree with yeah. Zia about the interconnected, the chaos of the new technology and I also think that it's a pan-Arab thing. I think the pan-Arab thing is allowed, is facilitated, it wouldn't be possible yeah. without the Arab nation, without being ideological about it at all. I think it's much more of a tangible thing now than it was 15 years ago before Al Jazeera for these very concrete, specific reasons. Do we have, you still have something to say about revolution before we move on? Yeah, yeah. Somebody else, yes. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting, the word chaos and the word anarchy and the word anarchism. I mean, we're talking about key words and I just realised that something listening to this, that you know, the Occupy movement has been accused of not having a programme, not having a manifesto, not having a set of demands. And I think in the old left model of the workers' revolution, there was always a manifesto and a proposal for a new form of government, a new vision, a new ideology. Um, and what the Occupy movement and perhaps what's going on in, in, in the Arab uprisings is, is doing to confuse that is, is, is that there's not a pro not well we're going to have this ideological position be it anarchism the political movement anarchism rather than the chaos that you're talking about or any other ism um, yeah. or form of government representative democracy or whatever mm. so I think that's another thing that's incredibly um, important significant and scary and exciting perhaps at this time is that this is this is whatever you said, the reformation of the revolution, you know, is that there isn't programme-wielding parties in the old way that we know, in the old yeah. European and that consciousness. Is the strength. And that is the strength. Yes, that's and the strength. That, so that's, that's why I believe that the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement will go, uh, you know, a long way. Yes, the moment it has a programme and demands, that's where it begins to die. Well, I think, I think that it is very much of its time and it is very much of the technology um, there's something viral. There's also this thing I've only come across in the past few years, this theory of the meme 
M E M E. The meme, the, the thing that, you, that, that is yeah. running. Um, yeah, you've been reading Richard Dawkins too much. Yes. No, I haven't Similar. actually. I haven't. He came but up anyway, with that um, yeah. it's come to, to me through yeah. another yeah. route through theories of political change. Yeah. You know, thinking about the Berlin Wall. You know, to my mind in 1989, it was like, well, how did this happen? You know, but actually, the delegitimization of that wall had been going on ever since it was built. So mm. I think there are multiple delegitimizations happening, whether they're muttered in corners or in, in small groups of people daring to delegitimize. And it is that critical moment. And, where, and what's interesting is it isn't anarchism in the political movement in, in across the MENA region. It isn't that. That's not the agenda. And I don't think it's chaos either. I think it's something much more interesting. Can we have a very brief comment from you? And then I'd like to change the topic a little um, bit. Oh, and <laughs> very brief. Go on, go on. Um, so in terms of it not being anarchism, one of the like main people that got the Wall Street thing going was an anarchist called David Graeber. And um, he makes a point that there's no demand because making a demand means that you believe that there is an authority that's legitimate and that it is, as you say, it's really good that there's no demands. Um, and I was just going to tie that into the previous thing about talking about power and a criticism of power. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that it's not anarchistic, the, the Wall Street thing. Um, no, that because is, that is, but I mean, I think about the Arab. Oh yeah, and maybe not the Arab Spring so much in such a strict way, no. But um, it is interesting, the idea of no reform, um, like no... It might be anarchism with a small a, not with a large a. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. point. So I don't think it's an ideological. Yeah. The idea, the lady on the, the, the on down below. This is it. There we go. This is actually slightly changing tack, Good. and uh, and thank Mom. you because I've really I don't feel I can make comment what's happening in the Middle East, but um, the word reform. If you're into the history of plastics, which I've been at some point, um, it's about. Uh, Ref it's about fashioning, it's about molding, it's about malleability, which I think is quite interesting as, as suggesting something quite different, a dynamic process, which you were talking about earlier, but, um, and, the, and the pos uh, a sense of possibility. But in both, in, in silver, jewelry, in plastics, in, in the materiality, mm. it has a slightly different sense about it. Yeah, th 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 there's a notion of kind of transformation. I mean, you know, you, 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 you're changing something that is malleable to something else in, in that sense. Uh, but many institutions, first of all, they are structures, they're not very malleable. Uh, and second, uh, if the, the notion of reform is clearly a kind of very linear and uh, black and white, meaning improve efficiency or, or modernize the system, then there is something, as I said, in the system itself that makes things worse, you know, the, 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 the so-called Jeevan's paradox. I suspect that, that plastics are not immune to Jeevan's paradox <laughs> they, because they are material things in that sense. Uh, but when we talk about reform in institutions and society, uh, uh, we kind of think differently. We, 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 we don't always see institutions as, as malleable, uh, um, I would argue. I'd, I'd like to bring the thing back towards Islam and the Muslims. Um, and here's a mess of questions for Zia, questions and, and, and comments. You know, we, d we have a problem in Islam and in the Muslim world, we have all kinds of problems. You know, we have mm. poverty, we have educational failure, or in some places the complete failure to build an education system at all. We have a he health crises, we, we, we have wars, foreign occupations, we have sectarianism, we have all kinds of social inequalities and environmental catastrophes and all the rest of it. There's all kinds of problems. In the way in which people read their religion, they read their foundational texts. Mm. Um, we have, um, uh, we, we, we um, have all kinds of problems too, um, which you've written at length about. Now, if you're saying that um, reform is no good, it doesn't work, it's, 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 it, it creates more problems than it solves, the first obvious question is, well, what do we do? Do we just sit here and accept the terrible situation? No. Um, that's the first question. The second, um, 
going uh, connected to that after September the 11th a lot of lazy and culturally arrogant journalism in the West um, without knowing anything about Islam or the Islamic world or the specific places in the Islamic world where these terrorists had come from and what was motivating them they just said there's a problem with Islam they need to have a reformation a reformation like we had a reformation mm. um, and of course as, as you've hinted at a lot of the people who are actually blowing things up are the reformists that's the problem is, is yeah. that actually we've had Ibn Taymiyyah was a great reformist, reformist and, and um, he blamed the um, Mongol invasion of the Islamic heartland on the Shia and on heresy and um, on innovation and um, he was a, a radical Puritan who, 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 who wanted to get rid of minority groups and stamp out difference. Then Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, after whom Wahhabism, the Saudi thing, which has unfortunately spread all over the place and its influence has spread all over the place. Again, this was, this was a reform movement. This was somebody in um, Central Arabia saw all of the silly superstitions of, of the people around him and the backwardness of, of these people. So he developed Ibn Taymiyyah's philosophy to be even more purist and radical and he went and, uh, uh, his, his people went and attacked the Shia shrines in Iraq and so on. It's in, in, in Pakistan there is a kind of low level war going on, one of the many wars which are going on between um, people, traditionalist Sufiistic Muslims who like worshipping in shrines, they like music, they like the art of Islam and so on, the poetry of Islam and these radical reformists, the, the new urbanized people in the Arab world, such people are very often doctors and engineers, they're people who've been educated in the modern sciences and they're very much against the old backward superstitions and um, these people are causing more trouble than they're solving. So what do you do? Do we yeah, just I mean, like step back and say there's nothing we can do, we'll just have to watch the, wor watch the no. Muslim world burn? Go no, on. I, mean, I, 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 I actually believe that, that Islam has been reformed enough uh, and we don't need any more reforms in Islam. I mean, that, that, that is my position. I mean, the 9-11 was, they, they were, you know, the 19 people who hijacked the planes, well, they were reformists. You know, they, they, they belong to the reformist movement, you know, uh, openly, uh, in that sense. So I think we, we've had enough of reform. What, what, what we need to do is to move forward to rethinking the whole thing. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's more of a transformation. We need a transformation within, within Islam, is rethink what Islam actually means for the 21st century, which is, I suppose, quite a radical position to, position, position to take. I'm not saying that everything in it is wrong, but I certainly am saying that we need to rethink the relationship with Islam and politics. We need to rethink how, for example, ritual has become instrument of power, and how mullahs control the masses through through through, through, through you know uh, uh, through rituals. Now, on the whole, ritual is supposed to bring people together. Uh, you know, the whole idea of a ritual is that you have a community around ritual and all that. Yet we've seen how rituals have been used to actually divide communities, uh, in, in in a sense. So I think there there's a whole area we need to rethink gender relationship in Islam. You know, we need. You know, we need to think what uh, the whole notion of what justice actually, actually, uh, you know, what is social justice within, you know, uh, uh, the framework of Islam. So I think it's time we are, we actually step back and looked at ourselves critically, uh, and and rethought uh, what we are all about in that sense. And that's what you may not understand it, even though you're my co-editor. This is what critical Muslim is all about. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and I think it's a very long process. So this is a quarterly journal, uh, 100,000 words uh, every, every, every three months, uh, to actually rethink some of these things, to look at them very, very critically and see what, what does it actually mean now in that sense. I've, I've actually, frankly, I've had enough of reform. You know, the last thing I want now is, is reform. I don't want NHS to be reformed. You know, I don't want the traffic cones to be reformed. You know, I don't want Islam to be reformed. I don't even want modernity or postmodernism to be to, to be reformed. I think we need to go to it in a totally different place, right? We need to move over and above all this to a new space, right? Uh, which is a trans which, ha which is a transformative space, uh, and we need to rethink, imagine. I think it begins with imagination in that sense, and that's why I think literature is, plays such an important part. Art and literature. Uh, 
because we need imagination. We don't even know what this new space is going to look like in that sense. And therefore, we, we need to sit back and imagine in a, in, a, in a sense. And I think imagination has a very, very important part to play how we move forward uh, in this kind of new transformative space. Yes, that's a very good answer. I mean, in, in support of that, I'd just add that I think there's a specific danger in trying to reform a religion or something that's based on a, a revelation because you have, a, with a revelation, you have a pure moment. And in Islam, you have a, a pure society. That's the way it's, you have a moment when the prophet was alive and he was organizing a society in Medina and Muslims would say there, that's the, yeah. that's the moment when God was acting directly on earth and, you know, through yeah, the see, direct I, I, I would like to start by, the, by saying we need to rethink that moment mm. and, and reinterpret it. Mm. It, it, mm. it. It may not be a pure moment at all. Mm. A lot of my criticism is that, in fact, it's, it's a very human moment. I think that's really and, important. And human, anything that has anything to do with human beings, by definition, includes errors and faults. That's what makes us human in that sense. So we need to rethink that, 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 that moment itself. Well, that's really important because without that you just get this infinite regress towards the imagined mythical zero point when everything mm. was was fine and and the ideal is in the past mm. and not in the future so it kind of immediately undercuts the idea of progress and moving forward because we have to move back to get back to we just have to cut away to get back to this pure moment so I think that's really fertile that idea that maybe that pure moment wasn't pure maybe it was a, a historically conditioned moment subject to the mm. fallibilities the of human yeah. beings and the prophet never claimed that it was anything other than that actually um, but if you go to most muslims and say that to them mm. if you sit down with a group of ordinary muslims if there's such a thing and, yeah. sa and say that well this sacred moment isn't a sacred moment they'll say what are you talking about you're no, not a no muslim you're this you're no, no, uh, so no, no robin they won't say what are you talking about they'll say get the hell out of here before we before we throw you in a prison or something e or, or do something nasty to you um, so there's my so my yeah. question from that is yeah. so therefore how practically yeah. do you go about setting you know this 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 criticism how, how, how do you and how do you make it something which and this is an, something i'm trying to answer myself how do you make it something which is not just the preserve of an intellectual elite, which in yeah. most Muslim countries is very small proportionately, yeah. Yeah. And, and something that's a part of a social movement. How do you engage with ordinary Muslims? Yeah, uh, uh, day before yesterday, I was at Lancaster University and they had a, this kind of question time thing uh, where there was, you know, there's, there's a Charles Clark, myself, Claire, Claire Short, and somebody else whose name I forgot. Uh, and, you know, they had all the university faculty and, and, and students uh, asking questions. And, and, and the questions were selected by them. There were four, four or five main questions that, that we had to ask. And, and one was that, uh, are university relevance relevant? Do we need, a, do we need a, a people, uh, do we need people to have degrees? Uh, and there were various opinions on the, you know, on, uh, on the panel. Uh, and my position is, is it's not just that that some people should go to university, but that every per every individual needs a university education in that sense. Uh, why? Because I think in contemporary time, the issues that we face are so complex and so interconnected that you need certain amount of intellectual equipment to actually deal with them. I mean, there was a question about somebody asked, and a lot of heated debate on it: Should we send plumbers to universities? And I said, look, plumbers need to do plumbing, but they also need to, re to read Plato and Aristotle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they also even ought to read Derrida and, and learn to appreciate art and, uh, uh, you know, uh, art, art and culture. Uh, and therefore, I would argue that, yes, plumbers should go to university uh, in that sense. Uh, we, 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 we have reduced the human to, to kind of uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a very basic form. Uh, and I think we need to promote kind of both education and critical thinking across the board. Uh, now it is automatically assumed that if you are a peasant, for example, you are, do not have any critical faculty. I invite you to stop any peasant in Pakistan, right? Ask him who is his favorite poet. He will not only tell you who is his favorite poet, but he will actually recite mm -hmm. verbatim, right? Half the bloody divans. 
and then you can sit down in the village square to discuss the merits of Iqbal or Ghalib or Mir Taqi Mir or whoever his favorite poets have to be. People do have intellectual faculties. It's a question of how do we open them. What I, this is where I become a reformist in the sense. What I, do, what I do think that this is not something that can be done overnight. It is, it is something that is a, is a long-term agenda. We need to promote thought. And the greatest problem for me, from Muslim point of view, is, is the lack of thought, is the lack of critical ability, the lack of ability to engage critically and look at things <coughs> and say maybe the pure moment is not that pure. To, a, to be able to say that, you need say certain processes of thought, right? Which, which are, in a sense, you need your, an open mind. Uh, you can't say that if your mind is closed and you accept the pure moment as pure, pure moment. You need to question it in that sense. Mm. And I think it's a, it's a long, long term process, right? Uh, and that's where I'm very hopeful. I, am, I, I do not despair at, the, at these things. I think the more criticism and open mindedness we can promote, the better it is. And clearly, people in Tahrir Square, people in Tunisia have demonstrated not just open mind, but a great deal of critical thought and how they have actually. Uh, led this, this, this uprising and how much thought they, and the thought was kind of on their feet. They were thinking on their feet. Mm. It's not something they, mm. they didn't have the. Well, I was there. They, they, were the, they wouldn't have the luck. You were and there, you were, you, you were there for it. Read. Yeah, that is square. We spent two weeks. Of critical Muslim. Two weeks quality time yeah. on that is square. Uh, but what I, uh, go yeah, on, finish yeah. your point. I mean, I mean the, the point I'm making is they had the ability to think on their feet and think quickly and think deeply and critically. Uh, and we need to kind of promote that and exploit that. I was there two Fridays in a row when there were demonstrations going on in Tahrir, and what I was so impressed by, I, I don't want to disrespect British demonstrations because I haven't seen one for years, but the, um, God, I live in Scotland now. You know, but were you there uh, yesterday? Uh, I yeah. So you, you can, um, th the last time I was on British demonstrations was a long time ago, and um, not because I don't support them, just because I live miles away from anything. Um, um, but what I, you know, there'd be one demonstration and then at the rally at the end there'd be one person speaking at a time on the stage. Uh, and not normally Tariq Ali. Uh, normally Tariq Ali. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, He's not speaking now. In, in Tahrir, um, anybody who wanted to set up a stage, there were lots of stages at once and, um, and everybody was... There was no kind of leader, and uh, uh, going back to that theme, and there were uh, a lot of people had gone there not to listen to who the man on the stage, but to have an argument with the people standing next to them. So you know, I kept wandering into these different arguments. The uh, Muslim Brotherhood people and secularists would be arguing about the role of religion in politics and can it have a role, and they'd be having, a r and they would be listening and using, uh, you know, using examples and even changing their point of view slightly. It was. It was really very impressive, and I haven't been in an environment like that before. So that's just to back up what you're saying. I think a few more people want to... Yes, again, from the gentleman there. Um, I find it interesting when you, when, you, when you mentioned about the need to be thinking critically. And um, I guess in the history of Islam, there have been various... I mean, one of the things, uh, thought and thinking, knowledge, seeking knowledge, were things we have always encouraged. And probably the, the, the various moments in Islamic history when we had peaks was when thought philosophy, all that was at its highest. And the fact that the first word of the Quran that was given to the, that was uh, mentioned to the, to the Prophet, it was revealed to the Prophet was to learn, was ikra, was learn. Yeah. So yeah. the importance of yeah. knowledge and, and thinking and the faculty of thinking has always been quite prime in Islam. But I was just wondering, when you, when you mentioned that the, the need of the moment is to think critically, um, and you also mentioned quite interesting one of your examples of how when it comes to pensions, um, there's always two sides to the reform, and and, there's and therefore there's one person says this is what what is good, the other person says this is not that's not what's good, this is it's something else. Um, so what it comes down to is when you think critically, there has to be a basis on what you c on what you think, and it's and the issue is when when you have different different um, d definitions of e efficiency or def different needs, that there's this clash, and, and and I can bet that the human society will go on for ages debating and thinking and discussing, but it will not get anywhere unless you have a common basis, uh, a common system of values, a common basis of morality, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. Mm. And unless you don't have that, yeah. you can't get anywhere. And that is why I actually find that there is a need for this, therefore, religion and then for God 
because it comes with a set of values. It comes with a, a, a set of, of what is right and what is wrong. And then, so the, I was, the question is, what is going, if, you, if you're talking about thinking critically, what is the basis? What is, the, is, it, is, it, is it secularism? Is it contemporary thought? Or is it your own opinion? Or is it, I, I would think that you would have to go back to the, to the revelation to the Quran as a basis because, yeah. and use that to, to think critically. I, uh, well, I, I, I agree with, 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 with the last part. If, if you are a believing Muslim, then you have to go back to, the, to, the, go back to Revelation. But there was a time when you could say this is good and this is bad. But that time has now gone. Uh, things are good in context. You take a lake, a freshwater lake, uh, all your animals, you know, your deers and your camels come and drink from that, from that lake. Uh, but that lake is only good as long as the water is flowing. Stop the water flowing, the same animals come and drink from the same lake, will die because the water becomes, becomes polluted. The word sharia means way to a watering hole in a sense. Uh, uh, but to what watering hole? If it's, if it's a way to a polluted water, wa wa uh, uh, watering hole, then you're not going to quench your thirst from there. You, you know, it's it's, it's going it's to affect you a great deal in that sense. So conventionally, what we, may have, what, we, what we may take as good may not be that good given the context that it is. And even Islam allows you for that. For example, certain things are halal, but they are not halal uh, under certain circumstances and they become haram or, or other way around. We are not supposed to eat swine, but if you are starving, then it's halal in that sense, you know, transformation. So here, the Islam itself tells you that context changes the meaning of what is halal and, 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 and what is haram. Now, normally, of course, the words halal and haram are associated with things like halal meat and, and prohibition, don't do that. But actually, they don't have that meaning at all. Halal means praiseworthy. Uh, and what is praiseworthy may, 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 may depend on, on, on context and timing. Halal means blamesworthy, things that are blamed, you know. And they've got nothing to do with butchering, you know. That's all contemporary phenomena. So halal chicken that lots of people go out there and, 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 and eat. There's a whole generation of young uh, blacks black Muslims, mostly from Somalia and Sudan, who spend their, their most of their time eating at these halal chicken uh, 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 outlets. And they go there because they think it's halal and it's good. In fact, that is probably the worst possible chicken to eat. It's full of fat and, and we are gonna have a major epidemic of unhealthy black Muslims uh, who are now in their uh, mid-twenties in about 10 years time. Uh, because they think they're, 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 they're actually uh, you know, uh, eating halal uh, and therefore eating, eating good. In fact, they're, they're eating halal and eating bad in that sense. So you, 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 have, you really do have to think. I mean, uh, about a year ago, I went to my, uh, I was passing by uh, in Corindale where I live, the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken, and it says halal Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I was sh actually shocked. I said, Kentucky Fried Chicken can never become halal as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's just a nasty, horrible stuff, right? Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter I mean, how you slaughter the chicken. If the, ch the chicken is sick, you know, you're going to end up sick full stop in that sense. Uh, so we really do need to rethink what it means in that sense. And the luxury that, that we could rely on what is good and what is bad is, 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 is not there anymore. But also, morality evolves, right? Over morality at this moment is a much broader scope of things than it ever was during the time of the prophet. In, for example, we don't think now it is okay to abuse women. You know, uh, we do not think, for example, that it is a good idea to throw homosexuals from the mountains and you know, or, or stone them to, or stone them, stone them to death. Why? Because our morality has evolved, and we have a much more pluralistic notion of what morality is in that sense. Uh, and therefore, you have to question what Islamic law says, and you have to see what, in what context it evolved, and, and, and what, what, how its meaning has changed, and, and what kind of law that you can drive from Islam now that will, in, that will be more in inclusive and, 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 and pluralistic. The, the problem is that when people of religion start to think about good and bad, they, they, they often forget that these are contextual things. They think that good and bad are, bad are absolutes. But there are some good and bad which are absolute. It will always be bad to uh, murder people. Uh, and it will always be ha good to help somebody in distress. 
Yes, there are certain, but in a vast majority of things that we come across in, in contemporary times uh, are very, very complex and it's not easy to decide whether it is good or bad. Is it good that we should do genetic engineering? Is it good that we should move towards genetically modified food? I don't know. I think these are things that need to be debated and, 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 and contested. Uh, and in some cases, we may not even know the answer because they have a future in built into it. So, for example, we cannot say whether genetically modified food is good or bad till genetically modified food has gone through, mm -hmm. through a cycle. You know, it has gone through the food chain for 10, 20 years, and we can see what its long-term effects are. So in 20 years' time from now, when people start dying, then we can say it is bad. But in 20 years' time, if people become even healthier than they now, then we can say it's good. But at this moment in time, we cannot decide because it has that in the future inbuilt. Now, that's a very complex notion of what is, go what is, what is good and bad. Uh, and, and simply saying that these things are absolute just does not help. So y y you're saying that Islam, rather than give us giving us a, a fixed morality or set of morals, it gives us a vocabulary and a framework. It gives us a vocabulary and framework to within work in. which to discuss absolutely. moral issues absolutely. and work out moral issues. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And 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 these and and, and it's a constant struggle. It is, it, it is not a fire given. I mean, the real problem with most Muslims is, is they think everything is a priori given. In fact, virtually nothing is a priori given. Almost everything has to be worked out, and you have to see what context you are in. You know, uh, uh, things change, and they change very very rapidly. You want to come if, back? If I may. Yeah. Um, you're quite right about, um, in, in the last point that you mentioned just now, about um, that it's a set of values and it's a set of things, and it's a framework, and that co things change, co context change, technology has changed. Te technology is one of, the, one of the things that we most obviously see that changes. And, and, that, and, and so we have to address these technologies with, with those values. And uh, what I appreciate about Islam and what I think is the most, the most biggest thing about it is that it gives you a set of values, it gives you a set of morals. And how we as human beings today, and how we always see things as good, or we define as good and bad, is based on what it, or we benefit from it. So as you just said now, uh, if, if we don't benefit from pesticides or, or genetic engineering, then we see it as bad. And if we do gain from it, we see it as good. And that's how we generally do it. Uh, that's how we classify what is good and bad. That's, 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 as, that's it, and that's always from our perspective. And that is the issue with discussing things on, on that level. Because it's always w my good and bad is not necessarily your good and bad. And that's uh, subjective. And that's what I'm asking you. So what, what is the, it ha there has to be a basis. There has to be a common uh, basis of morality to be able to say what is good and bad on the whole. And that is what Islam gives you. It gives you, um, if I understand, it gives you a basics of morality, what is right and what is good, keeping in mind not individuals, but as society as a whole. And that is the key, because in Islam, it does, say, it does give you situations where it's not good for the individual person. For example, in interest. I mean, obviously, interest is, is good for a lot of people. It, gives, it, gives, I mean, it can give you a lot of money. But how Islam sees everything is, is in looking at society as a whole. And it sets the frameworks and it sets the guidelines as what is good and bad. And, and it gives you a, a set of moral guidelines. And the issue that we have now is that, mo as you said, morality keeps evolving. So you're saying, I mean, if, if, if I get you right, to depend on a morality or on a system which keeps evolving is quite anarchic. Because, I mean, I, I come from India, and, and today, the, I mean, this year, earlier this year, I think last year, they came up with the ruling saying that uh, homose homosexuality is not illegal anymore. Til, till then, it was illegal. So in a system where morality keeps changing, it gets chaotic, because mo one time you're saying one thing, and then it could be a situation in a, in a span of 80 years, you've been in jail for 50 years for being homosexual, and then later 10 years, you don't. So depending society and, and having society depend on something which is constantly evolving is a very dangerous notion and I don't think but, I mean, it's inevitable though isn't yeah, it? Human beings evolve all the time I mean it's, 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 it's a general rule evolution has been going on since, since but the thing since with Islam since is that the basics since, since, the, be since, since the beginning of time I, I'm sorry to say but that's a very narrow view of Islam I would say I, I would I would argue that's a very narrow and to assume that ev that that it's all given uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a big assumption when you when we say it's all given what we actually mean is that it's all in the Sharia uh, and what I'm saying is that actually, as Sharia stands at the moment, it you know is past the reform point. It has to be reformulated almost almost uh, uh, totally. But we we shouldn't get involved too much in a, in, a, in a religious. I just wanted to say that my my disagreement with you would be that every religion and every religious sect and every political ideology 
think we'll argue it that is precisely. distinguishing between precisely. good and bad. Yeah. So you've got fundamentalist Christians bombing yeah. abortion clinics yeah. because they that's right. Um, and and you know, I, a frame. I I, I am um, an atheist, but what I value about discussions about religion or political ideology is it is a framework within to discuss values. Yeah. And especially if we're living in an in, you know in intercultural, globalized world, we're never going to agree on what's good and bad. It is a constant discussion. It's a rolling, constant negotiation. And and I think that's the best we can hope for, personally. But 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 hopefully we can reach a cons consensus. Possibly. <laughs> the, no, the, the, the anarchists disagree. <laughs> <laughs> now that now that now now that we've got a, a non Dawkins reading, but meme using atheist here, <laughs> it yeah. g well. that gives me an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. that yeah. gives me an opportunity to be Iblis's advocate, and. Um, the devil's advocate, and, and, and ask Azir the shocking question, which, uh, which a lot of non-Muslims or atheists or people in the West who just don't get why religion is so important in some parts of the world still, you know. Mm. So uh, what they would ask is, um, why not just abandon Islam? You know, if, if, if in the mm. name of Islam people are mutilating female genitals and they're, they're forcing people into marriages and they're... F punishing homosexuals who haven't bothered anybody and, 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 and they're doing this, that and the other yeah. in, in the name of Islam, why don't we just get rid of it all? Yeah. Well, I mean, one can, one, can, one can throw that question back and say, well, why not get rid of secularism? Look at how much damage secularism has done, you know. Uh, I mean, most of the uh, kind of destruction of the 20th century, you know, from the, from the world wars, to Khmer Rouge or uh, China, Cultural Revolution in China, they were basically, in a sense, atheist cultures, cultural rev revolution. You know, why don't we get rid of, uh, of secularism? Uh, for some people, there will always be need, uh, there will always have a need to believe. It's part of what, we make, you know, what, what makes us human. Uh, some people need spiritual uh, nourishment. Uh, uh, and if people believe in the truth of religion, I don't see anything wrong with it. Provided they don't shove it down my throat, you see. I mean, I don't want a secularist shoving down his secularism down my throat, just as much as I don't want a Muslim fundamentalist or a Christian fundamentalist shoving his fundamentalism uh, 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 down my down my throat. However, I think it does religion and, as the, the lady says, political system and ideology do provide you with a framework of, of, of thinking. We don't think in vacuum, right? Uh, Almost everything we, we, we think about, either we think with words, we think with concepts. Uh, that's why we're discussing the word reform, both as word and as concept. Uh, or we think in paradigms, or we think in certain frameworks. And these things provide us framework to, to, to actually think about. Uh, what I would argue is that whatever we think about, we should think about them critically. And provided we do that, we can engage with each other and come up with some sort of, you know, compromise or some sort of negotiation consensus which makes us all happy. Is that a happy point to end? We're going to end there? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean Go on, let's continue this. Um, so we a, how long do we have? Five more minutes. I just still have one, one question. What is yeah. the basis on which you agree on something? That's, I mean, there has to be a common framework. If yeah. We can go on discussing and, and discussing and discussing, but you, have yeah. you can't... For, a simple, for one simple question, how do you know, how can we decide, if you were to sit and dis discuss yeah. whether lying is right or wrong, you would never, we would never get to a solution until we can, we, we always get down to a moral decision, a, a, moral, a moral basis, w whether it is right or wrong. Yeah, you see, uh, we, uh, you see, and I all mean, I'm asking again, is, again, you're, 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 so my you're, simple you're, question you're, is, you're, you're what is the basis? That's all I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, you see, you're framing the question in, in black and white. Is lying right and wrong? Well, actually, it's both. Uh, they're, they're in certain circumstances, for example, when you have to save a life, you, you, you know, you, you, you lying may be good. Uh, you know, I mean, if, 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 if telling of the lie actually saves somebody's life, for example. So it's a, you, 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 you're doing something to, 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 to achieve a, a, a much greater good in that sense. So things are not as black and white. You've got to move away from a black and white universe. That black and white universe does not exist any, uh, uh, anymore. Now, normally, we don't start off with a basis 
uh, when, we, when, we, when we discuss. We start off with an open mind and reach a basis of which is on which conclusion is, is, is formed. If you came here and said the basis is that my position as a fundamentalist Muslim or whatever is the absolute right position, then we are not going to get very far in, a, in, in, in our <coughs> discussion. But if we all collectively discussed the issues involved and reached a conclusion that the fundamentalist Muslim position is the best, that will be a, a good thing. You know, so you're putting cart before the horse. In contemporary times, we don't start off with a, with a, with a fixed uh, absolutist position and say everybody must accept that. We start off with an open mind and reach a consensus which satisfies most of us. Now, it won't satisfy all of us. It may satisfy some of us partly, but if we are going to exist as a, as a, as a, as a community, then it, it, that's good enough to my way of thinking. I think there's a distinction as well, like the example you gave about homosexuality was a crime in India mm. until that last year. Recent, very recently, yeah, and yeah. now it's not a crime in, in India. That doesn't necessarily throw somebody into a state of moral confusion, because I think, I mean, people will have their own positions on whether or not homosexuality is a moral problem. I think it would be possible for somebody to think, well, for me personally, it is a moral problem, and yet yeah. I can accept that the, it's not the state's business to be punishing it or to be interfering here. Yeah. So we can have, it's an area which is not criminalized by the state, but it might not be, you know, it might, but it might not be, I'm, I personally might not think it's a good thing, you know? And, and also a recognition that everything is in flux, that we, we, that societies are constantly changing. So if we come to a decision that in our society we're not going to t send to court or send to prison or, or physically punish homosexuals, um, what am I talking about? <laughs> I thought you were talking about homosexuals. I was, and then my mind went completely blank. Yeah, it happens. I think it's called... It's a Freudian thing. And it no, no, no. It's, it's, got, it's, <laughs> not, it's got absolutely nothing to, f to do with Freud. It's called old age. It's, yeah, I'm getting... I'm Middle age, thank you, actually. <laughs> well, I think it's all relative. Zia's a bit too old and needs to go to bed, so I think we yeah. should stop it there. Yeah. And um, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much. Coming. Thank you.